Thank you. Thank you, all of you who've brought us this far. We've lit the Advent candle of love. And, you know, it's hard to know if it's good news or bad news when it's your turn to speak about love. I mean, it's a big target. It'd be kind of hard for me to miss it, right? But on the other hand, what else can we say about love? But that, that's the thing about love, right? There are no words, and there are so many words. Sometimes we feel so overwhelmed by love, you've been here, that you just don't know what to say, but you try anyway. And so we stretch the corners of language. We stretch the language corners and we stretch them to the corners to try to say what it is that we're feeling about love. Love is the subject and the object of our lives. We want it. We give it. We receive it. We remember it. Its absence breaks us. Its presence heals us and sustains us. Love is what we were made for. And in the language of faith, love is another name for God and for us today, for Christ. Even for all this, for all the prevalence and powerful influence of love in our lives, sometimes we still focus too much on lesser things. Now, those lesser things are important. We cannot ignore them. We cannot pretend them away. But if we have any hope of addressing the problems that face us as a small community in our families, in our world, if we have any hope of addressing them, it will be because we've spent a lot of time focusing on love and gaining power from that focus. And so, after all, it is a good thing to get to talk about love today. To talk about and tell stories about when everyone else leaves, love shows up. How that love throws a line. How that when all seems lost, sometimes love finds us in spite of us. And how that just saying I love you makes love grow in us. The poet, Gerald Manley Hopkins, wrote, Christ plays in 10,000 places. And he was saying in his unusual syntax something that Christians have insisted on forever, and that is that the Christ may be seen in me and in you, and it is our task to seek out the Christ wherever and to be the Christ wherever. Jesus said, when you feed the hungry, when you clothe the naked, when you visit people who are in prison or people who are sick, you have done it, Jesus said, for me and to me. And so what do we do? Well, we get out there and do it. We build churches. We build hospitals. We work in schools. We work in social service agencies. We are philanthropists and neighbors and friends. And we are people who get out there and love. And in this way, Christ plays in us. I read an article the other day, and I want to tell you that it doesn't really matter when this article was written. It could have been four years ago, eight years ago, 24, 40 years ago. It doesn't matter. The effect would have been the same. The writer was talking about the fact that after every national election, those whose candidate lose, loses uh, spend a lot of time lamenting. Well, now the whole nation is going to fall apart, we say. And again, it really doesn't matter when that was written, because whenever your team loses, that's how you feel, right? But his point was that our values of decency and compassion are not as dependent on who's in the higher offices as we might sometimes think. It's the people on the ground. It's us. It's the institutions closest to home that keep the fires of love burning. And so again, what do we do? We work in schools. We work in hospitals. We work in social service agencies. We work in nonprofits. We become neighbors to each other. We're kind to random strangers and they to us. Christ plays in 10,000 places. There's an example of this that I want to tell you about. I went to a luncheon just a few weeks ago, and it was actually hosted by one of our own members who is here today, Rosie Moncrief. The, the purpose of this luncheon was to raise awareness about sex trafficking in our city. And the stories were told in the only way they could be told, and that is in heartbreaking terms. The, pro the, 
The Star Telegram has recently run some articles about it, and you can read their details about how it is that children and, and young people and adults get caught up and are victimized. The articles also tell some stories about successful sting operations, as our law enforcement and social service agencies have worked on this. And you can Google those articles if you want to. But for our purposes, I want to tell you about the people who are working on this problem. Among them is a task force here in town, it's been together since about 2014, called Five Stones. Our own Kim Bushlow, sitting right over there, is on this task force, and I've now joined it as well. I guess Five Stones is named for the five stones that David took to kill the giant. I, I didn't ask anybody, but it makes sense to me. The force is divided up into several subgroups. One group is working with the victims, and they're providing help and resources for the very long journey of healing that must take place after this trauma. One group works uh, in education. They're, they're educating the public, people like me. They're educating other social service workers who need to know more about how to best address this and work with the victims. They're, they're uh, educating uh, people in the mental health field and in the physical health field. So they're working on education. Some others are working on prevention. They're reaching out to kids, uh, at-risk kids. They're offering services that would meet needs which, uh, when are unmet, certainly contributes to how kids might get caught up in something like this. Another group works on advocacy, and they're staying on top of local and state policies and, and legislation that is affecting this work and that affects the victims and the perpetrators. One group of women, or maybe some men too, go into the strip clubs to visit with women who are there to find out if they want out. They're throwing a line, actually. They're taking little, little packets, little bags of gifts, and they have like lip gloss and stuff like that in them. But always inside those bags is a little note that says, you are loved. The woman telling this story about her committee work said she went back to visit one of those clubs for a second visit to see if there's anyone there to talk with her, and she saw one of those notes taped on the mirror. It meant something. Whether or not the women in that particular club respond, we won't know for sure, but we will know the message has been delivered and that it mattered to someone. The final group that gave its report at this task force meeting are the people who work with the perpetrators. And the guy speaking said, yeah, yeah, I know. I, what you want to do is throw these people in jail and throw away the key. And he said, but our group, in our group, we're trying to overcome that. We're trying to work to rehabilitate because we want to help them recover their humanity. I heard all of this knowing that this 10,000 places would be my jumping off point for this sermon, and I thought, yeah. Well, here's another story. It runs in a different direction. There's a composer named uh, David Lang. He's a Grammy Award-winning composer, and he is about to perform a piece of music which he prepared to be played on broken instruments, 400 of them, and the musicians, 400 of them, aged from 8 to 8 years old to 83 years old. <laughs> Some of them are novices. Now, some of the instruments have been repaired, but it's going to be an interesting performance. These broken instruments are from the Philadelphia school system. They came to the attention of an art curator who was just, for some reason, visiting an unused high school. And in the gym, the abandoned gym, he saw all these beautiful pianos pushed up against the wall, and he thought, oh, my goodness. Where's the rest of them? And, and are there other instruments? So he calls the school district. I love this guy, don't you? He calls the school district and he says, where are the instruments that used to be here? And certainly now he's talking about several schools. Well, he's collected 1,500 broken instruments, started a fundraiser and has begun to repair them and has repaired 500 of them, returning them to the schools so that kids can play. Also, uh, sending with them um, repair kits so that people will know how to make minor repairs. So this composer heard about all of this, and he wanted to get involved because he said, this is more than a musical project. This is a social and community project. 
And so he said, we're going to use this music to heal com the community. And the broken instruments, he says, have a message beyond themselves. Because they're broken like people are. How we break into tribes and groups and we go against each other. But that is not what we learn in music, he said. In music, we learn to come together to make something great that we are making. And we sure need more of that today, the composer said. And I thought, well, the light of Christ in broken instruments. Where we least expect it sometimes, right? One more story. This one's less dramatic, but nonetheless, great story. Um, I read on a blog, and so this young woman gets a chance to learn again to appreciate where she is in life. So she goes to the grocery store with four kids. One of them is a baby on her back in one of those little pouch things. One of them is a three-year-old saying her belly's aching, and she's just got to have that donut because she didn't get to eat her lunch before she came to the grocery store. The other is a six-year-old boy turning everything inside into a weapon so he can aggravate his brother, who is seven, who has one dollar in his pocket, and he's got to spend it right now. And so you can imagine that mom is a little frazzled on this shopping trip, and she's probably been in that place before, but she's making it through. She's getting done. Finally, she gets to the checkout line and uh, gets over there to the place where you put your buggy back up. And as she was doing that, she turned, and there's a woman about 30 years older than her coming up, and the woman starts chit-chatting, and I'm sure the young mother's thinking, I just got to get in the car. But the young woman, the, the older woman says, I, I saw you in the store, and, and I know what you're doing is really hard. She said, I kind of miss those days when my kids were with me. I don't miss the hard part, but, but I miss the sweetness of it. And then the older lady said, let me take a picture of you. And so and in the blog the picture is shown and she says you know we looked better than I thought <laughs> and she said before that woman walked away she looked at me and said I just want you to always remember that what you're doing matters being a mom matters as you might imagine, that young woman was moved by the kindness of this reminder. And it was one of those times when love passes between you and you know it and you feel it and somebody has known you, somebody knows you're in a struggle and that what you're doing is hard. And there's not enough words to talk about that feeling. But we're talking about human connection. We're talking about acknowledging the life of another. We're talking about just saying what you're doing is important. We're talking about throwing a line. So I'm going to invite the band to come back. We all have to tell these stories. I think I jumped the gun on you. I gave them a cue, and I, then I did it wrong. We all have to tell stories about the 10,000 ways that love shows up, not because telling these stories will rescue every, every person who's trafficked, not because it completely restores the community to tell a story like this or to even show an act of love. Not because if we tell this story, little Brady will quit aggravating his brother. No. We tell these stories because we are honoring the efforts of love. We are honoring the surprises of love. And we are saying again that love is always there and that love sustains us. You and I are among those 10,000 places. But maybe we have to remind ourselves of that again from time to time. And so that's what we're doing here with the lighting of this candle. Maybe we need to remember that one of the enduring meanings of the story we tell every Christmas is that when God became flesh, it was a validation of our humanity. It was a one more time of pronouncing that humanity is good. We are good. People are good. And you and I are part of this goodness. We're part of this scheme. We're part of this divine order of things to bring love into the world. And so together, never giving up on stemming the tide of injustice, never losing faith in the value of a single kind word, and never doubting that just saying, I love you, will make love grow in us.